Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Susan Coffin. I'm here for Attitude to welcome you to our ADHD Experts webinar today. We are very pleased to have uh, Dr. Timothy Willens join us today to talk about ADHD and substance use disorders, how to recognize and how to manage addiction in adults and adolescents. Many experts believe that ADHD is a risk factor for substance abuse disorders and an estimated 15 to 25% of adults with a lifetime history of substance abuse disorders also have ADHD. So how is ADHD really linked to substance use disorders? Um, Dr. Willens will be talking about a variety of factors that play a role in the connection, um, everything from genetics to the dopamine receptors in the ADHD brain understanding the high correlation between ADHD and substance abuse, as well as the catastrophic effects that substance abuse has on both the individual and the family is, is key to helping clinicians prevent addiction in individuals with attention deficit. So thank you so much. We're very grateful to Dr. Willens for his time today. He is a very well-known ADHD clinician and researcher, as well as chief of child psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital and associate professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School in Boston. In addition, he's the Director of Substance Abuse Services in the Clinical and Research Program in Pediatric Psychopharmacology at Mass General. Also, he's the author of numerous published papers and studies, and I want to mention specifically one book that might be of interest to many of our listeners, and that is Straight Talk About Psychiatric Medications for Kids, which is now in its fourth edition and really is a, a must-read. So, Dr. Willens, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Well, thank you very much, and I really appreciate it, and it's a great honor to be uh, on this webinar. And I have to say that this is like one of my favorite subjects. It says probably something about me as a practitioner and clinical researcher, um, but it's really the intersection of work I've done for years, and um, and it's a uh, it's and starting by that it's a fun group to work with people who unfortunately get hit with both disorders. Um, it uh, we're, it's a group that there's a good outcome for. So I'll, we'll get to that at the end. Um, what I'd like to do is, first of all, talk a little bit about my disclosures. I do work with a number of uh, companies making new medicines for ADHD, uh, safer types of medicines for ADHD. That would be abuse deterrent stimulants, so that is uh, close to what we're talking about. Uh, most of the funding for my lab comes from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and I appreciate their ongoing support. Um, and also some of the com compounds we're going to talk about uh, for ADHD in context of substance use disorders are not FDA approved in that combination. So one of the only black box on, for example, stimulants is the concern about abuse and dependence of these medications. So we'll be kind of discussing that at the end, and I want to be sure people appreciate that. So to remind you in terms of an overview on ADHD, um, it's the most common presenting neurobehavioral disorder in childhood. As you know, it's not the most common disorder. Uh, for example, anxiety disorders are more frequent, but people actually going to get treated. It's one of the most uh, common presenting uh, disorders. We call it neurobehavioral because it affects um, both behavior and it lives in the brain, and there's clear neurologic tracks or neural signals that we know with ADHD. How often does it occur? As you know, roughly 6 to 9% of children and about 4 to 5% of adults. And we're actually really interested in that, that the persistence of ADHD is about 50 or so percent. And that chronic course, as we know, is, is, is characterized by uh, inappropriate, developmentally inappropriate amounts of inattention, distractibility, significant impulsivity, and hyperactivity. Um, and about, as we said, 50 percent continue into, from children continue into adulthood with this disorder. And that group is a group that we think are particularly at risk for substance use disorders, and we'll come back to that as we go through the talk. ADHD is associated with impairment in multiple domains. It, as you know, it's not just a cosmetic disorder, and that may also be adding to the risk for substance use. And as you know, you've heard with countless webinars, and we're going to again get to at the end, both non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic treatments work. So this disorder is treatable, and we're going to talk about at one point, what is the data on treating ADHD and the risk? Does it increase using controlled substances like stimulants increase the risk for cigarette smoking and substance use? Does it have no impact or does it actually decrease it? So 
I'm going to start with people who have an addiction. So we're starting with people with substance use disorders, SUD. You're going to see that's my favorite acronym for substance use disorders. I've always loved that, SUDS. Um, and what I want to make the point is, is that substance use disorders is a risk factor for ADHD. So this is just from an older paper that we published on the illustrative overlap of ADHD in all adults who have substance use. So it's starting with different ones listed on the left side of your screen, multiple drugs, opioids, cocaine, alcohol. And on the bottom is the range of ADHD. What percentage of the population of, let's say, alcohol had ADHD? And you can see it varied from the 30s up into the 70s. Um, tighter and closer when you talk about drug use disorders like cocaine, opioids, and others. If you look at more recently all of the literature of starting with addiction and looking at rates of substance use, if you look at adults where the, most of the studies are, almost a quarter of adults who have a substance use disorder have ADHD. Um, if you look at substance use disorders in adolescents, my, many fewer studies, or transitional aged youth, kind of that 20s, what you find is those rates are closer to 50 to 60 percent. In fact, we have a, 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 a special outpatient program at Mass General Hospital where I practice for young persons with addiction. It's an outpatient service. And what we found is about 65 percent of those cases have ADHD. So ADHD is definitely overrepresented in addiction, uh, thinking that the population rate, again, in adolescence is going to be close to, let's say, 7 8%. In adults, it's 4 to 5%. We're talking in the 20s here. The next slide is a complicated slide, but I like to have it there because it is the scientific proof that childhood ADHD is related to future cigarette smoking and substance use disorders. So if you start at the bottom, this is the likelihood. They call them odds ratios. Anything, if you look at that bottom graph to the right there, Anything to the right of that line going up and down would indicate that you're at increased risk for ADHD and can contrast that to anything to the left. So everything is to the right, which means you're at increased risk. And in fact, you're at two to three fold increased risk to smoke cigarettes if you have ADHD through your lifespan. And the one above it is actual substance use disorder. So at the top of the slide is substance use disorders. Again, all of those little colored lines, those colored dots are to the right of the line, which means you're at increased risk. And how much so? About one and a half to two-fold increased risk to develop substance use disorders if you have childhood ADHD compared to those who don't have childhood ADHD. So what we have is a bidirectional overlap. Higher rates of people with addiction have ADHD compared to the general population. And if you're a kid growing up with ADHD, you're at increased risk. How much about two-fold increased risk? What else do we know from the literature? And we know that if you have ADHD and an addiction, so you, you've got both, it's not just that you have an addiction. You have more severe substance use disorder. It's a more severe form. We know that you, we have higher rates of other co, uh, psychiatric co-occurring problems. So it isn't just ADHD and substance use. It's often um, other things such as uh, you have anxiety disorders. You also may have conduct disorder it, with ADHD and substance use. So it's a complicated picture if you're a professional who's diagnosing it or if you have a loved one who has it, it's often not just they have ADHD and addiction, they have ADHD anxiety or ADHD and depression. That that complicates the picture. If you, you have somebody and you're working in an addiction treatment center and they have ADHD, they're less likely to stay in treatment. And that's also for cigarette smoking and substance use. It's harder to get better from your substance use and that makes it just a longer course, which is the last one. So it's harder on you if you have an addiction. It's going to be tougher to stick in treatment. It's going to be a longer course of substance use and a little bit tougher. But some of these data are derived from older data where sub subjects weren't treated. So we're, at the end of this, we're going to talk about do you treat this group. And that you can hear sort of already intuitively we think you should. So one of the big questions is, why does ADHD increase the risk for substance use disorder? Is it that there's a preferential self-medication that we know that we use stimulants to treat ADHD? Is it that people with a drug use disorder preferent and ADHD preferentially use, let's say, cocaine or stimulants? Well, this older study, many years old now, shows that, in fact, that's not what happens. It isn't, if you look at just drug use, people with drug use disorders, there's no difference really in what they use if they have ADHD or they don't. Um, 
in fact, it's basically based on availability. Whatever's available gets used. But it isn't as if people with ADHD are preferentially using cocaine or stimulants. We've also looked at a question on self-medication. Is there differences in why people self-medicate who have an addiction if you look at ADHD and controls? And the answer is no. Most people um, do self-medicate. doesn't matter if you have ADHD or not. To help change their mood, unknown is often internal restlessness or anxiety, um, some to sleep better. But there's, if you look far right, there is a minority who gets high, um, but that's about the same by ADHD, and it's a minority compared to how many use substances or continue to use substances to change the mood or unknown. Yeah, so there, the bottom line is there's evidence of self-medication, but it really doesn't vary if you have ADHD or if not. I want to move forward and talk a little bit about what we call prevention of substance use and ADHD. So it's a big issue about this whole area about um, is there data from treatment studies or long-term registry studies of kids who've been treated and then followed through the age of risk for substance use to see what is the impact of treating ADHD, A, and B, I think a lot of people still are worried, do giving stimulant class agents to kids cause problems later in terms of sensitizing them or kindling them to actually use more substances? This is a study that was done from the, um, from the Scandinavian registry studies, and it looked within subjects. So it looked at people with ADHD who were treated versus those who were not, but its main power was to look within people who were treated for ADHD during periods when they weren't treated versus periods where they weren't treated. So they were able to look at a whole lot of things. Um, what I want you to notice is the very large sample size. You're talking, you know, up in the uh, 30 to 40,000 individuals who were studied with this, about half were on medications, half were not. So some of the pre-existing literature were small samples, including data that we, we published as way back as 1999, showing a protective effect. But this is more important because it really shows a dramatic effect. And what I want to point out is if you look at the overall effect of treatment versus non-treatment, it's about 60% reduction in substance use disorders associated with treatment of ADHD. Also, it seems to be that you get about 15, um, about 10% reduction per year of treatment associated with ADHD treatment. So this is one study, and I'll show you another one, um, that shows that there's a very robust reduction in substance use disorders and those who are treated, particularly those who start earlier in age. And how early? This study was done, it's a United States study. This study was done by Sean McCabe at the University of Michigan, and I, uh, Mass General, collaborated with the University of Michigan in, in this study. And this is looking at the famous Monitoring the Future U.S. study. And this is looking at high school students. Uh, 40,000 high school seniors were assessed for this, 4,000 plus had ADHD. And what we look at is, in this case, marijuana use, because that's what the most common drug that's being misused in this age group right now. If you look at the population risk for the past year of seniors, that shows you in the red. But what I want to point out is if you look at chronic exposure, that means ongoing exposure, or you're basically taking your medicine for a few years, of, in this case, stimulant medications for a few years, the group that looked closest to population risk, which means you basically wouldn't, you know, non-ADHD group, are those who started the stimulant use prior to nine years of age. If you started the stimulant use and continued them on stimulants between 10 to 14, it was helpful, but you were at significantly higher risk than the, the population to develop to be smoking marijuana in the, uh, uh, in the past year. And if you started the stimulant to treat the ADHD in the kid after the age of 15 years, you were even at the highest risk. So there you can see a very clear indicator that the people who did the best started stimulants prior to nine years of age, which helps us. You know, I've always been it's sort of a, as a psychopharmacologist who's worked with ADHD for years, it's always been sort of elusive. When do you start medications for ADHD? And it looks like prior to the age nine. So what are some treatment considerations in individuals who have ADHD and substance use? 
and this is sort of the stoplight that I use. If you're looking at, we're going to say, at, you could say adolescents or adults here, but if you don't have a substance use history, it's green light. Use whatever. If you have a substance use history and you're clear of the substance use history by, let's say, six months to a year, it's a yellow light. You pretty much can use whatever you want. You can use stimulants. You can use non-stimulants. Not really too much to worry about, although you're going to monitor a little bit closer. But what about the group that is currently using substances who have ADHD? What kind of data do we have on that group? Well, first of all, we know that there are diagnostic dilemmas that you have to think about. So if you have ADHD and substance use, um, you are going to have worry about intoxication or withdrawal. Does the person really in withdrawal? Do they have transient or neuropsychological impairment because of their substance use that you're calling ADHD, but it's actually not ADHD? And then there may be traits of substance use like like risk-taking or harm avoidance that actually isn't ADHD. As I said before, is it other comorbidity, anxiety, that's influencing your diagnosis? Maybe they have anxiety and substance use and you think it looks like ADHD. One of the questions is, is it okay to use a report, a retrospective report from the, the adult who has substance use? The answer is yes. There have been papers on that. And in fact, if anything, they believe it or not, under-report. So you really don't, it's not like you get a bunch of scammers out there trying to make the diagnosis. In fact, they tend to be underestimates of the real prevalence. They, they underreport their symptoms. So what are we doing for this? And I love this one saying, for every complex problem, there is a simple solution and it is wrong. And there isn't any simple solution to this. So really, the punchline is, until recently, double-blind, sort of the Mercedes-Benz of studies that we use to determine if a medicine is effective for treatment, double-blind, controlled, randomized studies of stimulants did not support treating current substance use with ADHD. And you can see it in front of you. You have the slides. There were a number of different studies that were done, well-conducted studies. And what they kind of showed sometimes improvement in, in ADHD and sometimes improvement in, in uh, substance use, but not really robust changes. So it was, well, why do it? And the good news was from these initial studies, there weren't adverse events. There wasn't worsening of substance use. And it wasn't clear people were just handing out their medicines. So it was sort of like, well, what do you do? It's probably try to stabilize and then maybe treat. But more recently, this is a study from a colleague in, um, at Columbia University, Francis Levin. And I want to, and what she showed is that higher doses of mixed amphetamine salts XR, which is also called Adderall XR, is helpful for ADHD and cocaine use disorders. And on the left, you can see both 60, the placebo is yellow, uh, the lighter uh, shade of uh, red is, is um, the Adderall XR 60, and on the right for each of these bars, the darker red is the Adderall XR uh, 80 milligrams. And you can see that both 60 and 80 were significantly better than placebo to improve ADHD. So that's the percent responders. And you can see it had a good response with the higher doses of Adderall. And to the right was the positive urines. And you can see that that was significantly better um, with uh, the higher doses of Adderall XR. So you saw a step rise reduction in the percent of positive cocaine urines, and that's actually what you want to see. So fewer cocaine urines and ADHD response when you give higher doses of Adderall XR. So that was the first real study, but it used, that showed a positive effect, but it used higher doses of stimulants. For recently abstinent uh, people with addictions, this one was looking at recently abstinent alcohol use disorders. You could see that atomoxetine, which is also Stratera, was significantly better than placebo at reducing heavy drinking days. Actually helped. So it really helped, um, it really helped reduce heavy drinking days to the effect, it's a similar effect to naltrexone. It had as big an effect as naltrexone did in reducing um, heavy drinking over time. Now, it didn't do anything for relapse. So people still drank, but it reduced the amount that they did drink if they used. Another finding we had as a result of the previous study, when a lot of people asked the question, if somebody drinks, how much exaggeration of symptoms of ADHD might you see? 
and based on this study, we found about a 30% exaggeration in ADHD symptoms when people were actively using. What are some other less, lessons learned about how do you treat individuals who have ADHD and substance use disorder? This was a review article that our group did to take a look at different substances, uh, different, I'm sorry, psychotherapies that had been used in trials and what did we know about it. And what we found was that basically structured therapies appeared to be effective in treating both adolescents and young adults who had the comorbidity of ADHD and substance use disorders. And those structured therapies were typically cognitive behavioral therapies. And it shouldn't surprise us because there is a whole um, literature on using cognitive behavioral therapies for uh, adolescents and adults who have substance use disorders. And likewise, there's data for both adolescents and adults who have ADHD. So at this point, barring any other, you know, major negative findings, we think that structured therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy are indicated very early in the treatment sequence of adolescents or adults who have ADHD and substance use disorders. So let's think of some strategies for these individuals. In context of substance use disorders, you really need to think about treating ADHD. Certainly, if there's less severe substance use disorders, let's say you have somebody smoking marijuana mainly on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we think that you should continue to treat ADHD con uh, concomitantly. On the other hand, if you have somebody with severe substance use disorders, they're doing heroin, they're doing cocaine, they're smoking marijuana every day, if you can lean in and try to get the substance use under, under control first, use motivational interviewing, using cognitive behavioral therapy, you may withhold the treatment for the ADHD, it may not work, or, you're, or you want to send a message that they need to get the substance use uh, under control. And that works for some cases, but in some cases, if you can't address it first, or if the substance use is simply not responding, and you think that the ADHD is contributory, go ahead. Go after it. First of all, cognitive behavioral therapy, you can do that at any time. But think about using non-stimulants and think about using extended release stimulants, like Dr. Levin's study. Um, so these are options available, and the stimulants are going to give you the big, biggest effect size. That is, they're the most effective compared to uh, the non-stimulants. I have to talk a little bit about stimulant misuse and diversion. It's an important consideration, so I'd like to spend just a, a few slides talking about that. And first of all, the overall prevalence of non-medical use of stimulants is about 10 to 20 percent. We know that the most of the diverted stimulants come from friends, and we just recently did a, we're doing a study where we found the same thing. So if you're a practitioner out there, it isn't as though people are scamming you. I mean, once in a while you're going to get somebody like that, but mostly they're not coming in to, to get their stimulants from you. They're getting, getting them from friends, often friends who have big quantities of stimulants and hand them out or sell them, et cetera. Most of the motivation appears to be for um, alertness and concentration and focus and not so much for getting high. And it appears to be occurring in substance users during academic decline. So people don't just wake up and everything's going well and they use stimulants. They're starting to fall behind. About, as we'll see, half of them have a substance use disorder, and they're starting now to grasp for ways to help them themselves out academically. That seems to be the picture. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of that picture. This is a study that was uh, that we were involved with. It's the frequency. It's a brand new study of the frequency of non medical, non medical medications in the source, and it just helps you get a better sense of where people are getting them. And you can see they're getting them from friends, uh, and they're getting them from leftovers from prescriptions. Um, and so, some of the other some of uh, one of the things we're talking more and more to practitioners about is the old adage that we send people with huge stores of stimulants, particularly to college settings, may not be the correct way to do it. It may be better that kids get the amount that they need per month and then parents either have to get that to them or they send them to the local pharmacies for the kid to pick up. But the idea that we're sending two, three months at a time into the college setting, maybe just increasing the sources and may actually be causing more trouble. 
In this slide, it's just to help us get a better sense of non-medical use of stimulants. This is just a study that we did. We're looking at um, why people are using stimulants. And as I said, they're for performance enhancement. And you can see that the number one uh, reason is to help me concentrate or to focus better. Some say to help them stay awake, which is the side effect. And then number three is to reduce distraction. Um, so still many people are using them for that reason, and it shouldn't surprise you when we look at the characteristics of this group that many of them also have problems with neuropsychological impairment. If you're working with this population, another thing to think about is they have high rates of substance use disorder. So in this slide, what you're really looking at is this is looking at the development of any substance use disorder. In the red are those who have stimulant misuse, that is, Kids in the uh, college students who use stimulants non-medically. It wasn't prescribed to them. They're buying them. They're, they're getting them from their friends, and they're using them compared to typical college students who develop substance use. And you can see if you're a stimulant misuser, you have an earlier onset of substance use disorders, and more of the stimulant misusers have substance use, in fact, 50% compared to those who are typical college students. So almost 50% of kids who misuse stimulants also um, have a a uh, substance use disorder. And I sort of alluded to this earlier. We've learned also that if you look at rates of ADHD, they're higher in college students who misuse stimulants compared to controls. Almost 25% of kids who are out there in the general population, usually college students, who misuse stu stimulants also have ADHD, and that's considerably higher than the uh, baseline rate. Now, the next slide is a, is, is a little bit complicated, but it's actually very intriguing and interesting. And this study was done over a decade ago by one of my colleagues at Mass General, Tom Spencer. And basically what it shows is we've moved to using extended release pr uh, stimulant preparations in high-risk groups for substance use or people who were worried about misuse or diversion. And this is one of the studies that helped us understand both the need for using extended release st stimulants, but also why that happens. So let's start with likability. If you look in this, the uh, graph that's to your lower left, higher scores mean more likability, more abuse liability of the medicine. So you don't want a high score on that because it means it's more likely to be abused. The blue line is immediate release methylphenidate, and the green line is extended release methylphenidate. And what you can see if you give what we call equipotent dosing, that's the same amount in this, in the, that's in the serum, the blue line, which is the immediate release, has more likability, more abusability. And that is a consistent finding in multiple different studies. If you then look to the right, that littler, a littler, the smaller uh, figure, you'll notice that the binding is different in the brain, that the immediate release gets in faster, and that curve is actually steeper, and more saturation. And what that means is more gets into certain parts of the brain that are associated with that I like the feeling, high like feeling. So for a number of reasons, we're moving away from using the, extended, the immediate release stimulant medications to the extended release. Another consideration that's relatively contemporary in people understanding this is that there is a lot of misuse of stimulant medications by things other than swallowing. So in this uh, distribution, you can see uh, swallow, snorting, and others. And you can see that a big chunk, almost 40%, are snorting. They're grinding it and sniffing it in their nose, stimulants, which is a major concern uh, in populations. This, was, this is from our own data set here at Mass General. Just to show you, if you look first to the left, misusers, you know, you've got the uh, misusers who don't have substance use, and a chunk of them are using them orally in the yellow and in the green is sniffing them. But those who have substance use in particular have high rates of intranasal misuse. So not only are people out there misuse, you know, misusing stimulants, but like 30 to 40% of them are actually grinding them and sniffing them, particularly if the stimulant misuser also has a substance use disorder. And we worry about that because this group is at risk for emergency room visits, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, elevated heart rates, elevated blood pressures, and a whole lot of things. 
Not only that, we've learned that stimulant misuse in high school, this study was, again, with the uh, collaborative work with Sean McCabe at the University of Michigan in our group, and when we track these people 15 years later, what you find is that those kids who are high school seniors or freshmen in college who misuse stimulants, if you track them to age 35, they're at much higher risk for the development of a substance use disorder compared to those people who use their medicines appropriately. And this is, by the way, another data point that shows you that those people who use their medicines appropriately aren't at any increased risk for substance use, com- use disorders compared to the general population. So in conclusion, ADHD is a risk factor for cigarette smoking and substance use. And again, it's a two- to three-fold risk factor. ADHD should be considered in adolescents and adults who smoke cigarettes and or have substance use. So if you're working in an addiction center or you work around people with that or if your loved one has a a substance use issue, you should think if they have any of the symptoms of ADHD, they might have ADHD. A positive note, we know that treating ADHD helps protect against the onset of cigarette smoking, substance use disorders, and something I didn't present, substance use disorder-related criminality. And these are the large, massive registry claims data sets, not only from Scandinavian countries, the Danes and the Swedes, but also from the Americans through claims data and survey data. So we have this major convergence of findings. And when should you start treating to see the biggest protective effect? It looks before the age of nine. And treatment of ADHD and substance use for those people should consider treatment of both conditions. And the sequence is going to vary a little bit, and there may be questions about it, but it is something that I think um, really needs to be considered. It used to be just don't worry about the ADHD, it'll get better. Well, it'll get a little bit better with apps, you know, with, when people reduce their substance use. Um, Don't worry about uh, ADHD, it's not contributory. Well, it looks like it is contributory, and the data, especially using higher doses of stimulants uh, or with recently abstinent alcohol use disorders, seems to show pretty substantial improvements in both ADHD and the substance use. And finally, stimulants do have high abuse liability. They're controlled to substances. We strongly recommend that you think about using extended release preparations in higher-risk groups. And some colleagues of mine have just stopped using immediate release in certain high-risk groups. I'm not sure I'd go that far. I think I would just go to saying that we default to extended release. We try to rely on extended release and get creative around that to help keep the supply of immediate release down. And I would also add that we probably are obligated to not send massive doses or uh, uh, pill quantities of stimulants into college settings with the concerns that that seems to be the supply that gets that people use for misuse and diversion, those people who don't have ADHD. Oh, great. That was very, uh, very helpful. I think there's some questions here that maybe will result in your recapping some of the, of the main points, which is fine. So, for example, we have um, a listener who's nine-year-old son has been diagnosed with ADHD since age five, and she and her husband are considering whether or not to choose medication for him. In light of your research, what would you advise them? Yeah, and I I think that's perfect because it highlights there's two different data sets that aggregate now showing that there seems to be something around the age of nine that would indicate that that if you medicate before nine, you see the biggest protective effects, let's say for cigarette smoking and substance use. And I suspect you'll see it for other things also. Mm -hmm. So my sense would be age nine would be a special time for me to, I would say you should think seriously about starting medicines by age nine. Right. Um, I mean, I think what we find among attitude readers is that many of them are very hesitant to use stimulant medications um, specifically because they're concerned that it will increase the likelihood of addiction. I think that that has been unequivocally demonstrated that the stimulants don't increase it. And for a while, it was equivocal. We were the first group to actually show a significant reduction. And by the way, in our smaller but tight study, we showed a risk reduction, which was identical to the Swedish registry study, which is identical to the United States monitoring the future study. So I think parents out there really need to think about it the risk is really leaving ADHD untreated. It's not treating it. And the stimulants 
are clearly not increasing the risk for substance use or cigarette smoking. And in fact, they're diminishing it by up to 50 to 60 percent. That's a huge risk reduction. Right. Wow. Oh, just let me clarify one thing. This is a question from someone. It's a good one. Is it safe to assume that when you use the phrase ADHD, that this also includes what's known as ADD, in other words, inattentive? Yes, yes I use ADHD all-encompassing to sort of all the previous di- diagnosis, including hyperkinesis, hyperkinetic right. disorder of childhood, ADD with and without hyperactivity, yes. And it seems to, the findings seem to hold for all the different subtypes of ADHD, the inattentive, the hyperactive impulsive only, although that's a very small percentage, or the combined uh, uh, the combined subtypes. Okay. Yeah. I think that's something important for us to always point out because there's still tremendous confusion out there about ADD versus ADHD. Um, how can someone with a history of drug abuse talk to their doctor about ADHD treatment without being perceived as a drug seeker? You know, that's a great point. And one thing I would say is that the perceptions around use disorder, substance use disorders has treated, has changed dramatically. I wish I could say it's changed in all practices. And so this is changing and the stigma associated with it is decreasing immensely. Um, I really appreciate the question and the sensitivity of the person who sent that in. I think what I would say is if you don't feel comfortable saying that I have had a, a, a cocaine use disorder in the past, or I've had problems with cocaine or with amphetamine. You know, this you can say be less diagnostic and be more um, sort of generic to say I've had problems with using amphetamine in the past, or I've had problems uh, using too much cocaine. You're not labeling yourself, and in some ways it destigmatizes, but it still flags that this needs to be monitored, but shouldn't invalidate you for certain things. And what the other thing you might want to do is if your a problem with this was 10 years ago, you may want to say 10 years ago I had problems with amphetamine. If it was two months ago, you may want to say I'm in early, you know, I've just recently stopped my problems with cocaine and I wanted you to know that. By saying it that way, you're not giving that label. Hopefully that makes you feel more comfortable. Um, it is important for your uh, prescriber or practitioner to know that information know. now. Okay. Here's an interesting question from someone. He says, he says, I may have missed this in your presentation, but do you have an opinion on which came first, the ADHD or the addiction? Yeah, so it's uh, almost ubiquitously ADHD. By definition, ADHD, if you look at when it starts diagnostically, mm-hmm. it's usually down to age 3, 3.2 years, as we've looked at that for years. Um, so it's ADHD starts first, and then you get a, a, a addiction. You know, you think about it. Uh, 10, 12, 15, 18 years later. Having said that, there's a sort of an old residual concern in some people, can you have adult onset ADHD if they've used certain substances, like some people say mm-hmm. methamphetamine or largely stimulants, if you use high-dose stimulants or so, is there sort of an adult onset ADHD? And theoretically, you don't develop adult onset ADHD after using stimulants, and there's a whole controversy about does adult onset ADHD actually exist. What I would say is if it starts as a consequence of using certain substances, we would call it either an organic mental disorder or um, something of that nature so that it's a functional disorder that's developed because of substance use. It doesn't invalidate the use of stimulants or anything else that we use for ADHD. It just has a different, what we call, etiology associated with it or what sort of link to the development of these symptoms. Okay, interesting. This is from uh, a parent who's, um, they discovered that their son had ADHD that not until 11th grade, at which point he'd already been smoking marijuana for some time. And um, if stimulants seem to cause even further anxiety. She's just wondering what her next step should be. Yeah, so that's the type of situation where I'd try to get a good diagnostics of is it just ADHD or is it ADHD anxiety and a cannabis use disorder? Because if it is more anxiety in the clinical picture and it smells like it's there, based on the, just just if you look statistically, it's probably there, um, that what I would say is that this is a child that's going to require some intense cognitive behavioral therapy directed both at the substance use and skills training and cues, but also anxiety management. You're, they're going to have to learn. Otherwise, they're going to anesthetize themselves with cannabis. 
Um, right. Part two would be to think about pharmacologic agents that may help both conditions. So we have two classes of medicines that could work. You can use Stratera, which is atomoxetine, which works. It's been shown to be ang- break anxiety in kids who have anxiety and ADHD, and it helps ADHD, and it's FDA approved. Or you could consider using a tricyclic class antidepressant, which also helps anxiety and helps ADHD. Um, and then finally, those, so those would be my first two classes. The other things you can do is treat the, uh, the anxiety, if it looks like there's a lot of anxiety with a Prozac-like drug or Zoloft, and then you give a little bit of the stimulant back, and these kids do well. But they're going to require treatment of that cannabis, too, because it, it, isn't, it isn't as if you just treat the ADHD, that cannabis is going to melt away. It's still going to be there. So you're really going to need to focus on treating that cannabis and then treating the ADHD and probably anxiety. Wow. Okay. What's the best treatment for cannabis, for substance abuse, for marijuana addiction? Um, the best treatment for cannabis is going to be a psychotherapy of sorts. Okay. Um, and the uh, and so it's going to be, you know, sort of a cognitive behavioral therapy. It's going to be mm-hmm. family involvement, and families have to go to coaching and use. There's different models of engaging the families for that. Right. If you're using medications, there's something called N-acetylcysteine, NAC, which is a nutraceutical. You can buy it, at, you know, at, at the nutrition centers, uh, Whole Foods, different areas, and um, in younger people with addiction, that is adolescents or young adults, it seems to be helpful. Okay. Let's see. My teenager, this is a teenager who was diagnosed with um, ADHD at age 10 and now at age 22 is being treated for uh, marijuana abuse. The treatment center where he's being treated believes that ADHD meds will cause future, more addiction, and so they're not in favor of him. They won't give him his prescription for ADHD meds. Parent is wondering what to do next. Yeah, I think I think what I would do is talk with them about potentially using non-stimulants to see if okay. they would agree to that first, and if there appears to be appropriate management of the non-stimulant, and if they work great, if they don't work, then they think about using extended release stimulants. Uh, and I would hold it at extended release stimulants to see if they work. Um, and you know, there's a lot of concerns about that. I think what I would say is there's no evidence in any of the treatment studies where they've used stimulants or non-stimulants in active substance use in ADHD where we saw worsening of the substance use. So there's no data to support what that treatment center is saying. Um, on the other hand, we want to be respectful that they have a sort of treatment paradigm they're using, but I would say I would start with non-stimulants and then if then move from that to extended release stimulants to see if that helps the ADHD and helps the kid engage better in their treatment and do better. So, so you're you're thinking that extended release stimulants are seen as less addictive and less likely to cause quote being high. That that's I think what I understood you to say. That's correct. So the extended okay. release, you know, we showed there have been a number of studies that have demonstrated if you look at getting high and all these other things, it's the extended release stimulants um, that seem to be less misused, less diverted. And, and seem to cause less, pe- less uh, misuse in the individuals in whom they're prescribed. Now, having said that, we looked at, when we looked at our own data at Mass General just very recently, you know, we found that still people were snorting extended release. So it's not true they don't, ex- they don't snort them, but it seems to be, if you look at the aggregate literature, less frequently they're going to misuse seriously the extended release as opposed to the immediate release. The immediate release is really what people want to get their hands on. And those are the ones that tend to get you higher, making you feel better, as opposed to just to help you focus and study. Okay. Yeah, that's an important distinction that I don't think that we probably need to write more about, um, but that, if that's interesting. Uh, you mentioned, I think, something NAC or an over-the-counter treatment, Whole Foods. There's a number of people asking for you to repeat yeah. that. that um, sure. It's called NAC, N-A-C, and the other more sort of technical term for it is N-acetyl, A-C-E-T-Y-L, cysteine, C-Y-S-T-E-I-N-E. N-acetyl cysteine, it's a nutraceutical. You can get it at over the, you know, at the pharmacies, you can get it at Whole, you know, at GNCs, Whole Foods, whatever. I'm not endorsing any one particular area, but 
And the dosing that was done in a study by Dr. Kevin Gray, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry a few years ago, was 1,200 milligrams, 1,200 milligrams, twice a day. Can you go higher? Yes. But that seemed to be a dose that seemed to be helpful in two studies uh, to, help ki- to help reduce and slow down marijuana use. Um, and I've used it in some of my patients, and it seems to have a, an effect. It's not a huge, robust effect like you see with stimulants. But what you hear from kids is they just aren't as interested in smoking. They, you know, um, when you work with people with cannabis use, marijuana smoking, you, I don't approach it by saying you've got to stop the rest of your life. That, that, that'll get you nowhere. But I just say, let's try to see if we can cut back a little bit. And then if they can, great. If they can't, then I say, okay, let's see if we can give you something to help you cut back. And we treat them right through it. And sometimes they say, you know what? I just found that I didn't have to smoke as much. I just didn't need this to smoke. Hmm. And they don't know why. And that okay. seems to be the effect. So it's a, something that can be used. And you don't need a physician's prescription. It's on your own. Interesting. And AC. Great. All right. There's a lot of interest among the listeners in um, addiction, other kinds of addictions, video games specifically, and, and Internet addiction. And I And we hear this. Very frequently, an attitude is a huge concern for, for, for many of our readers. What, what would you say about the, the relationship of other kinds of addictions, such as specifically Internet or video games and um, ADHD and or treatment? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. And I have to tell you, we're a little bit remiss. There's just sprinklings of literature showing overrepresentation of everything you're talking about. We call those behavioral addictions, so mm-hmm. it would include gambling also. And, right. Um, but the literature, the studies that have been out there show increases with ADHD. But let me remind you, it's endemic even in those who don't have ADHD. So it's easier right. to see in your ADHD kid, but even in those who don't have ADHD, it's all over the place. There's tons of video game addiction and online addiction and computer addiction and social media addiction. But there does seem to be a relationship there. And in terms of treatment and video game addiction, I'm not sure um, there's any data on that. I would say that when it comes to video games and online, there's a huge extra factor that does play into substance use to some degree, but it's much bigger online. And that is a lot of the same kids that have video game issues or online issues, by nature of their ADHD or independent of their ADHD, um, they have a comorbid issue. Many of them have social and communication issues, Mm -hmm. and they really have problems with friendships. Their peer relationships are off, and the online community offers them, first of all, endless capacity to meet different people and others like themselves who might do very well if they don't have to have eye contact, if they can fidget and talk Mm -hmm. to people and they don't seem fidgeting. So it gives them a community to interact with. And that's not a terrible thing, by the way. We have to look at some of the positives. Um, And so I think that's an added factor. Substance use clearly gives you a peer group also, but it's not quite the same in terms of that. So I think that's an extra variable with video games and ADHD that just doesn't, doesn't, isn't as operant in substance use. Right. Sort of autistic spectrum disorder, especially specifically where find, having friends constitutes the group with whom you do video games. I mean, we, we have that's seen exactly, that. That's yeah. exactly right. right. So, yeah, that's really difficult for parents. Um, Vaping. This is a number of questions about vaping. And, and also, there are a number of people, let me just see if I can phrase this correctly, three or four people here who are saying that their children, and they're almost all boys, interestingly, are arguing that vaping and marijuana use help them relax, uh, make them, are necessary to them for functioning. What what's your thought on 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 that, and how should a parent yeah, so we'll respond? Start, so we'll we'll split it. So vaping, there's not a lot of data on nicotine and relaxation. There is some evidence, but not at the doses. When people vape, they're vaping almost a pack of cigarettes with each vape. You know, with each uh, wow, sitting really? and vaping, and especially with some of the jewel technology and some of these new technologies. Um, and we don't know what the effect of vapes are on the lungs. We think that it's deleterious, uh, a.k.a. the popcorn lung, and that we can see mm-hmm. damage to the fine skin linings of the lung when we use look at animal models. Um, number two, that the level of 
nicotine that people are getting, we know that nicotine can create a sort of neuroplasticity, which isn't terrible. That means it causes your brain to change just a little bit, but it also kindles, it increases the likelihood that you're going to have substance use issues later. So we've done studies with cigarette smoking, and we think it's the nicotine component of that. Having said that, we also know that certain types of nicotine can actually help people with executive functioning. You know, we've, I've studied that personally for years, that class, uh, nicotine and nicotine analogs, they call them, can actually enhance concentration and focus. So there may be some self-medication in that direction for these kids. Their executive functioning gets better. Um, moving to cannabis, cannabis, the two major constituents of cannabis is something called THC, which is tetrahydrocannabinoid, and we also have CBD, cannabidiol. Probably it's cannabidiol that has an anxiety-breaking property. So for kids who smoke marijuana, um, if they get more of the cannabidiol-laden marijuana, that may have an anxiety-breaking uh, component to it. Notice I say may. Are there data, randomized controlled trials of various formulations of marijuana or cannabis for anxiety disorders? No, there are no randomized controlled trials. Part of that is because it's not been easy to do those studies because you can't touch marijuana or you lose your DEA license. So there's been concerns because it's a banned substance by the, by the United States government. And so that limited it. So now there's a bit of relaxation to some degree and people are studying it. But it's still going to be a while before we know is there any positive uh, marijuana and what constituents for what disorders. We're not there yet. Okay. So, yeah, lots of questions about CBD oil here, and I think what you're saying is we don't know. Is that right? We, we don't know. We think that it's probably benign. There's been uh, Epidiolex, which is cannabidiol, has been FDA-approved for refractory seizures, and that includes kids with lennox Gano and Dravet syndrome, and that's been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's also been shown to be helpful for nausea and vomiting associated with uh, chemotherapy, uh, marijuana in general. So cannabidiol does work for seizures, um, and it may work for anxiety, but we're not there yet. On the other hand, we don't think there's harm, but we don't have good data. We know there's harm for marijuana, general marijuana, smoking good old grass, for kids, particularly under the age of 16 and under. So mm -hmm. we strongly, strongly dissuade kids from using marijuana because that appears to have a lasting effect. Can you say more about that lasting effect? Yeah, it affects, it affects the white and gray matter in the brain, so we can actually show that in neuroimaging. Um, you see uh, more. I've shown, let's say, a few years ago, I showed that if you look at kids who don't have any executive function problems and they sp start smoking marijuana, 25% of them develop an executive function deficit. By the way, those are stable. And there's data from uh, longer-term adult studies that show dropped IQ points with people who right. smoke marijuana as kids, as well as the persistence of executive function deficits. Once that I showed in adolescence, there was an adult study that showed if you started smoking marijuana in adulthood, no problem. If you started smoking marijuana as an adolescent, especially before the age of 16, you had executive function deficits that tracked into adulthood. So there is harm with marijuana in kids. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's really important, especially with marijuana becoming legal around the country. Um, this is a question that is a general question. It's really one that you you address to some degree, but I'm going to repeat it because there are a number of people here who are asking it. Um, these are the parents of adult children with ADHD who are now have serious alcohol problems in their 40s and 50s. And um, th these are parents or partners. There are several different questions about that. And their their question is, where should they start? How should they handle this? So, you know, it's, it's classic having a conversation and keeping the door open around the addiction. I would start with the addiction first. Okay. Um, and I would... And it's a gentle conversation, and it's a supportive one, not a derogatory one. Mm -hmm. And it's best to let the person kind of come to finding that this is an issue and use the person's own words. We use a whole technique called motivational interviewing, and what it is is you try to engage the person. Is everything going well? If it's not, where are the areas that are a problem? Don't go right to drugs. It could be money. Mm -hmm. It could be the person feels poorly, doesn't have time. And then from that, you 
get to the drug issue, hopefully through the person sort of opening up and saying, I think it may be I'm drinking too much, that I don't have any time to spend with the family, or I'm not feeling good all the time, or I'm spending all our money, they can say, okay, well, we appreciate that you realize that alcohol may be contributory to this, and then you start to open the door for treatment. The direct intervention, con- confrontation, they call them Johnson interventions, really mm-hmm. have to be staged carefully, and, and those are not particularly effective when you look at longer-term data. Okay. All right. Dr. Willens, thank you so much. This is such an important topic. There's just so much um, pain out there around these issues that I think the more we can make this research known as, you, as you've done, the more important it is. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you again, Dr. Willens. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. You love podcasts. The stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.